Welcome to today's Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series for the Woodbury Business School. We're pleased to have Todd Peterson join us today as our speaker. I have the opportunity to introduce Todd. First of all, Todd Peterson is the CEO and co-founder of Vivint Inc., one of the largest home automation companies in North America. Todd grew up in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and he's truly a man's man when it comes to hunting and fishing, and uh, he was just talking about helicopter skiing last week, and so if you can think about it, Todd's probably done it. I can't wait to hear your surfing stories, too. Baja, yeah, Baja 1000, yeah, it just, yeah, the list goes on. So next time you speak here, we'll have to have you bring some pictures of all those activities. Todd um, co-founded Vivint because he saw an opportunity in the security market to sell high-quality products using a personal approach. Under his leadership, Vivint has evolved from a groundbreaking idea into one of the fastest growing home management companies with more than 500,000 customers and 5,000 employees. Let's give Todd Peterson a big round of applause. Okay. But sometimes you get feedback. Yeah, yeah, I won't even, I won't even. Is this working? Man, I can't stand hearing my own voice. You know, you think you sound like a dork when you hear your own voice? Um, haven't you guys ever done that, recorded, heard yourself recorded, and you're like, I don't sound like that. That sounds weird. Um, so anyway, it's, it's good to be here. Um, I always appreciate um, being able to come and speak to uh, younger people. Not everyone's younger, but you know, a lot of you. No, you don't have gray hair. It looks gray from this, but you're young. Um, but anyway, I really do. I, I work with a lot of younger people, um, and you know, I love the energy and the drive, and you know, in, in doing that through the years, I kind of sometimes forget that I've uh, started to age myself. So I actually do, I did just go uh, helicopter skiing to British Columbia, but my, after like th the third day, my legs were telling me that I was uh, 44 years old. So I was starting to feel a little spent, but it was, it was a good time. Um, so um, let me give you just a, a brief, brief background on, you know, how, you know, why I even started this, uh, this business, which, just so everyone knows, it was a pure accident. Um, there was no, you know, end in mind, um, big business plan. Um, you know, some, you know, it was a brainchild of me. That's not what it is at all. And in fact, that's not really necessarily how I operate personally. Not that that's not a good way to operate. It's just not. It's just not my style. But I was, uh, I served an LDS mission in uh, 1988. Who was, where, who, when was some, was anyone born? You guys were probably born about right then. That's so embarrassing. I, yeah, anyway, I do feel like I'm getting old. But so 88 to 90, Dominican Republic, I come home from my mission and, uh, you know, I'd already gone to my freshman year. I come back and my dad, um, he, I get home and he's like, hey, you know, how are you going to pay for school? And, you know, my dad is an orthodontist and, you know, had some money. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're, you're paying for my school, right? And, uh, He's like, no, 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 you gotta pay for your own school. We're not, we're not gonna help you out. Well, I had 10 brothers and sisters, my three older sisters, and I then had two younger sisters going to school. They, he was paying for their school, so I'm like, and I'm, I'm the first boy, so you'd think he'd be taking care of me. He, he didn't. Drops me off, I, I had to bum rent off of a ex-missionary companion who had just gotten married a month before, that's no joke. One bedroom, basement apartment, I slept on the couch for three months. I didn't have a car. So I'd done construction through high school, so I went and got a sheetrocking job. Um, and uh, anyway, that didn't work out that great. The guy that we were working for was super lazy, didn't ever have jobs on time, uh, tools and, and nails and screws and the stuff, and it was never prepped. So my companion and I got the bright idea to start our own company, which we did. Um, we worked underneath someone else's licensing, but we, you know, we went out there and, and did that. And then, in the meantime, I had a friend of my mom's who had a house cleaning business in Salt Lake. Um, she had used to live in Idaho Falls. And it seemed like she was making pretty dang good money cleaning really you know, rich people's homes. And I'm like, well, geez, I can do that. I, I know how to clean toilets and mop floors and do all that stuff. So I actually started a little house cleaning business, by the way, knocking on doors up in Provo on the bench and uh, hired students or friends of mine that were students to go clean homes and I did the same and so this is kind of how I was getting myself through school and um, I had uh, a couple of buddies so this is kind of you know early uh, 90s so 
90, summer of 91, end of the summer of 91, I had two friends of mine who had um, been from California that went, worked for a pest control company out there um, called Clark Pest Control. And they, they worked for this company and they made like ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 selling pest control services in one summer. These guys provided the leads, they went and closed the sales. And I'm like, well, and that was back, and I think still that's probably a decent amount of money in the summertime, I guess. Um, so I'm like, well, I want to do that. And, and by the way, I'd fallen off a scaffolding and I tore my shoulder, my right shoulder. So it killed to, sh to sheetrock. Um, so I went and interviewed with this company, long, long story short. Went and interviewed with the company. The owner said no. He said, I don't think you can do this. Um, I don't think you're what we're looking for. I don't think you do a very good job. And, and I'm sitting there going, okay, I pay 100% of my school. And I'm saying this to him. I sheetrock, which is you know one of the more lowly, I loved it by the way, but more, one of the more lowly jobs. And I clean toilets for a living and you're not gonna hire me. And I'm willing to do that. Um, and still he said no. I called him seriously 20 times when I came back to Provo. And his name's Scott and I'm like, Scott, are you kidding me? You're not gonna hire me. Nope, sorry, no no's a no. So and that's kind of how I kicked off my company. It upset me. I went and found a pest control company um, called Terminex who would allow me to go work with them. I hired some buddies. Um, we went out and you know went to Arizona and started selling pest control services under Terminex. But cold call, door knocking, I kind of learned to do that on, on the LDS mission pretty good. Um, and we actually had pretty dang good success. First summer I made $80,000 um, take home. That's, that's not bad in four months, especially in 1992. Well, my, my intention was to just go through school, save the money, pay for my schooling. They called me back and they said, hey, can you hire 80 people to go out this next year? We kind of liked that. And that was, that, was the, that was the fatal mistake. I said yes. Um, and then, and then this ended up happening. So, and I was supposed to be an orthodontist. So, and, th and by the way, orthodontists, they, in the summertime, they only work three and a half days a week. They never work Fridays. And uh, I've probably guaranteed I've worked more hours in my short career than my dad worked in his entire, you know, at least at his job. Worked hard with the family, church callings, all that stuff. But, um, and that's kind of what, you know, being an entrepreneur is about. I mean, there is no off time. Um, even, in fact, when I'm, when I'm off, except when I didn't have cell service, but at night when I did have internet service when I was in British Columbia skiing, I'm working into the night, late into the night, into the morning, um, you know, making up for the, the fun I was having. But, you know, um, it, if any of you are thinking or, or thinking about eventually owning your own business, being an entrepreneur of sorts, um, it's very different than I think a lot of people think when they're getting into it. And I hear it a lot because I see a lot of people's business ideas. Probably three to five a day is probably very realistic, if not more. At least that come across my desk, I don't look at all of them. And it's always, and I just saw one last night, um, da, 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 we think we can make a ton of money. Um, that, was the, that was kind of the end message. We think we can make a ton of money. And I'm telling you right now, um, that's the last thing that happens, and it's the wrong reason to do it. Um, if you're going into business at any point in time and the end in mind is to make money, um, I can promise you that it probably won't work. In the end, at the end, at the end of the day, there's going to be zero satisfaction because money and you know, you may, I remember when I was a college student, I'm like, man, if I had $10,000 in my pocket, my, my worries are over. I mean, I could, I could live forever on 10,000 and back then it was really cheap. Um, but money is never going to bring anyone satisfaction. In fact, um, I was just talking to a good friend of mine. We just sold you know, our company for a lot of money, um, two plus billion. And um, I sold some of my equity, so you know, my wife and I got a you know, pretty decent payout, more than 10,000. And I always thought that if I ever had 10,000, I'd be happy. Well, you know, we did, we got it. And, and I, we've had payouts before, but... Um, not, not, a, not an ounce of increase of happiness or joy or excitement or change. I still change like a poopy diaper that morning because I have a two-year-old. Um, nothing changed with my relationship with my wife. Uh, my daughter is still 15 and dealing, you know, nothing changes. So again, don't have that as an end in mind for any business. And in fact, um, when it comes to careers, it's the same thing because a career 
there's a lot of work, there's a lot of ups and downs, there's a lot of interactions with people and personnel and issues you're gonna deal with. And if you're going into a career saying, okay, what makes the most money? I'm t and you've heard this before, but it's just so true. You're just not gonna get personal satisfaction from that. You're gonna get personal satisfaction from trying to do your best at what you do, enjoying and believing in what you do and what you're, you're personally about, and bringing that either, either to the business that you work with um, or the business that you're, you're running and trying to grow and, and create into something great. So um, again, that's probably the, the biggest message I could give you is, is, is please you know, go and do something that you think is gonna be impactful in some way. And that could be to a few people, to a lot of people, to yourself, to your family, to those around you. Um, but you know, go into something saying, in doing this, I think I can make a difference in some way, somehow. Um, and again, it, it should be, if, if you own a business, to the customers that you'll have, because if you have a business, you'll have customers. And it definitely should be to the employees you have, which is something that I've always, always tried to be driven by. Um, in fact, my dad, when I, I dropped out of school in, I guess, at the end of, well, no, no, it was, it was spring of 93, I dropped out of school. And my parents called, and they're like, oh, we're kidding, we'll pay for your school. If this is about paying for school, we'll do it. And um, I said, no, 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 that's not what it's about. I've got this you know, gut feel. I kind of liked it. I kind of liked what I did. The sales aspect, I kind of liked this. Again, had no idea that it could become something you know, bigger than, than what it was back then. But my dad, he, he drove down to Provo, and he's a man of very few words. And he sat me down. We were sitting on the grass south of BYU campus, and he said, if you're going to do this, um, you have to make sure that you provide the best service that exists in whatever you're going to do for your customers. And secondly, you, and this is about, and this is, I'm probably overemphasizing the num you, number of words you used. Secondly, you've got to treat your employees like gold because they are the asset of your business. Your employees are your asset. And thirdly, the profits will come. As long as you make good, sound, solid decisions, um, the profit will come over time, but that can't be the objective. And I've tried to live by that um, and you know, add maybe a few of my own details along the way when you get, we're now more like 6,500 employees and 700,000 customers. Um, you know, you've gotta add some of your own details along the way inside of that, inside of that. So um, anyway, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting you know, ride when you go through and, and, and build a business because um, there are an amazing amount of uh, challenges that come about on a daily basis. Um, but the bottom line on it is it's always, always, it comes down to personal interaction. Again, customers or employees. And are you delivering or not delivering? Are you coming up short on expectations from employees with the service that you promised to deliver? Um, are you continuing to innovate and improve your services? Because if you aren't, someone else is probably staring at you, if you have any success at all, staring at you and saying, okay, how can we um, maybe take advantage of what this company is built on and done and make it better? So there's always someone in business um, kind of gunning for you and for your client base. So you have to be constantly thinking about what are we doing? How does that, how's that perceived by our customer base? How are we going to make sure we're improving our services that's gonna add value to their personal lives in, in some meaningful way. And if not, you will lose that customer at, at some point in time. We see it, we do lose, lose customers. And sometimes it's you know, financial change and different things, but um, innovation is something that's very, very key to our business. Um, we've evolved dramatically over the last 10 years. And um, if, you, if we got into a real deep discussion over what Vivint is and where I believe Vivint's going to be in three, five, 10 years, we're gonna look very, very different in five years than we look right now as a customer, or as a, as a company from a customer's viewpoint. Um, and part of that's gonna be um, some, our next you know, year to 18 months of um, me messaging and branding around new services that we're building um, on, on our platform. So the, the other thing that I think um, for me that's, that's been extremely critical is and, and this is, you can take this as a, as a, as a employer or you know, a boss or 
even an, an employee. Um, because in, I actually am an employee, uh, if you want to think about it. I'm an employee of Vivint. I may have been the, you know, one of the founders and the CEO. I'm still an employee. So as an employee, and I actually, I actually really view it that way. I don't, um, and if you came to my office, or if any, I don't know if anyone works here or knows people who do, I don't um, pretend that I'm the boss, because I'm not the boss. I have specific responsibility. Um, I need to do that as, as well as I possibly can. I get up in the morning, um, and some people do positive affirmations. I might do them, I wouldn't admit it if I did. Um, in the mirror, like for about 15 minutes in the morning time, um, but after I've done my hair and brushed my teeth. But um, I get up in the morning and, and um, I have a, a review of my day, what's coming up, what I have to do, and I literally think every day, how am I going to add value to this business in my role? Um, and I think that every single day. And I actually try, I attempt, maybe I think my wife would somewhat agree. I try to do that as a father and as a husband also, by the way. Um, I don't always, um, in any of them, execute perfectly and sometimes not even that great. Um, but I at least try to do that. And, and, um, and even when it comes to, and this is, again, this is just me, but I actually contemplate in advance uh, you know, of a meeting or a negotiation or whatever, I try to take a view on the business, what's happening, what we're doing, and how I need to add value and, and try to help move along whatever we're trying to, to do with that segment of the business, that particular negotiation. And I mean, I have, I have one of my employees coming in this afternoon. I have a very good background on what's going on with this, uh, this individual and um, some of the needs and requests. And so I've already thought through, at least in my view, um, some counsel that I think I'm gonna be able to give him that I know he's kind of looking for. Now, always keep in mind you know, what he's gonna say and things he's gonna mention that I probably don't know about. Um, but you know, again, if you're going out into the workforce, I can tell you right now that, that you're gonna add value or you're not. <laughs> and, and there's really not that much in between. And, and someone who kind of gets by and floats, uh, and there's, there's a lot of people who do, you're not adding value. You're just flat not adding value. Um, and, and, I could, and I wouldn't ever do it, but I can name names of individual people inside of my company, executive level, middle management, VP level, uh, and, and, and below that, managers, sales reps, whatever. People that I know without question well, I don't ever question. They're going to add value every single day and bring a positive impact on this business. And I don't even have to say anything. I just know they will. Those people are moving up inside of the company, gaining uh, responsibility. And by the way, with that normally comes increase in, in uh, you know, um, income potential, ownership, stock option potential inside of the company. Um, so, you know, you've got to think about this, you know, especially right now at your age is, where am I, what am I going to be doing most likely um, and, and how can I, you know, and, and just this popped in my head. So I've got a friend of mine from high school who's transitioning um, careers and he's, he's got a massive dilemma and, and I was asking him some pretty poignant questions last night. He's been in a sales role in a company and, um, and the, uh, so, He's looking to transition. Now, there's a ranking, you know, if, you're, if you are in sales and there's 200 salespeople in a company and you're looking to transition outside of the industry and you're bottom 20%, but you still have a job, or you're top 10% and you're going out to compete for, for a job or a new career, right now in this day and age, you're in trouble if you're transitioning and you're bottom 20%. And there are people that are bottom 20%, and in my opinion, that's choice. Every single time, that's choice. And why do, why do I say that's choice if you're top or bottom? You'd think that that's just, it, you are where you are. But in, in, in sales specifically, why is someone, it's a choice to be top 10, bottom 10? Why? Well, it's about how hard you're willing to work. That's right. I mean, that, that's actually, that's it right there. Um, and that's really in anything you do. If you know, some of you are gonna be dentists or doctors or lawyers or um, you know, um, educators, you choose where you stack up against peers um, inside of your industry and even how you run a company. Um, 
I spoke, I spoke um, in California about, and it was probably six weeks ago, to the entire, you know, anyone that I guess wanted to show up, security industry. Um, and again, that's just one component of what we do. But, um, you know, we started, you know, kind of a Q&A session at the end. And one guy said, look, you've been in the business way, way um, fewer years than we have, most of us. And yet you're, you know, probably most people there were hundreds of times bigger or thousands of times bigger. What's, what's the key? What? And I said, honestly, I guarantee you, I outwork every single one of you every single day. Um, and when I am working, and it's not just hours, the effort and the intensity, um, and if you saw my calendar, and I'm not saying this is smart, but I don't have a break um, in my calendar. I eat, and this again, take breaks if you want, but I eat in my office um, if I'm not if I'm in town every single day I did it yesterday I did it the day before um, I don't go out to lunch and hang out with the buddies and you know hour and a half two hours um, I try to be productive the hours I am working if I'm gonna do it I'm not gonna be with my family because that's kind of my other option I'm going to be productive and that's a choice that you make um, now you know can everyone build um, and is there a lot of good fortune or blessings that come along with you know going from nothing to you know, a $2 billion company? Absolutely. Um, we do not, no one, none of us, you know, control our own destiny. Um, you can help influence it, but we don't control it. So um, that's, that's the bottom line. And even you guys know this. In school, um, can, you, can everyone in here get straight A's? Absolutely, absolutely, you can get straight A's. You choose not to, period. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you're not great at math, what can you do to be great at math? You just put more hours in. Um, you know, if you don't get a certain math concept, great. But you, none, no one in here is um, at a level where they can't, with time and effort and energy and commitment, get it figured out. Um, that is a fact. So, again, the, you know, life, that's what's great about life is we have choices that we can make. Um, so, anyway, those are just a few maybe random things that kind of came to mind. Um, with me, but um, the 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 cool thing, and again, this is this is a major driver for me um, in w what I'm doing and what I'm trying what I'm trying to you know accomplish again as as the w in, within the role that I have is um, do something unique and interesting um, inside of whatever industry that I'm going to be be in, and and try to be disruptive. We have some just some really cool things that we're that we've been contemplating and working on over the years that we're gonna be launching this year and over the coming years, that man, I'm, I'm more excited about you know, what I'm doing now than I've ever been. And this is, um, how many years is that? 20 plus years, it's almost half my life um, doing what I've been doing. And I still have incredible passion for it. I get it up and I get excited to go to work and work with the people I get the opportunity to work with, um, which for me is, is, is everything. I mean, and again, back to, you know, do something that you're, that you are passionate about and you believe in, that makes, that make, makes work fun. If you end up making good money or good income through that, um, that's a massive bonus and upside. So, um, what, what time is it? Got, uh, 30, more minutes. 30 more minutes. Does anyone have any, any questions? And I'm, I'm like super open book about personal life, um, anything, anything is like fair game to me. So, unless it's future projections, and I know this is going to be like put out there on, I cannot give future projections. We have publicly traded bonds now, so they've they've like muffled me a bit in, as to what I can say. Uh, you talked about you've had your company seen growth, success, and use the word evolution, it's a really good word. Um, especially, I'm, I'm at the beginning of income tax plan. There's always, you bump into these ceilings. Yeah, so you know, I know, I know, and actually, I have I have a few people that I meet with. Uh, there's uh, a student at BYU that comes in that uh, I guess he, I we talk. He I says on our, our thing I'm his mentor, but I, I don't know. He just we talk, ask me questions, we talk. 
I would like to say I had one. Um, I didn't have time, honestly, I didn't have time uh, to, well, I did have a few that I tried, and interestingly, the few that I had, and I won't mention names, but told me that my business idea was dumb. Um, my, and I, I'm, I'm built a little bit strange. My mentor has been more um, about people that have doubted um, what I was doing, what we were about, what we were trying to accomplish than anything. Um, and and I, again, there's, there's a particular you know, company that just in the recent 18 months, you know, we went through the sale process, it was right before that, um, kind of scoffed at our business and our ability to c continue to grow and evolve and innovate as a company. I wake up every single, and this is, this is not, I'm not saying this is positive, every single morning and I think about them. Um, and uh, it's just, again, how I'm built and it's not necessarily, it may be flawed a bit. I'm gonna make sure I prove them wrong every single day. And that's maybe, uh, if you wanna say mentor. Um, I've actually loved, and I remember a guy back in college walking up to um, BYU campus, actually as my, I was dating my wife, I was, had dropped out of school and stopped and whatever, I don't know why he had the reason of saying it, but he's like, your business idea is so dumb, it's never gonna work. I remember that and I remember that and I remember that and I remember that. I don't hate him, I actually like the guy a lot. But um, anyway, my family has real money, that's a stupid business idea, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's a totally stupid business idea, it's worked out pretty decent, um, but I still remember it. Um, and, and the other thing is um, that I'm kind of driven by never being um, satisfied with accomplishing what we set out to do, and I, it's hard to describe. If you worked in, inside of Vivint and our you know, executive staff, we're all kind of built that way. We set out you know, goals and objectives for, for the business, and we'll blow through them, and way before we've even gotten there, we're over it, it's done. And in fact, um, it's kind of, it was kind of the, when this, you know, we, we, we kind of had a goal not too many years ago to you know, hit, from a valuation perspective, $2 billion, but I'm so over it, when it happened, I didn't even care. Um, it didn't, uh, again, I didn't raise my blood pressure in a positive way, anything. I'm like, I'm over it, and we're on to the next uh, objective, which is you know, much larger than that. Um, so again, I, I do, what I have done is I've tried to maybe be open-minded about what's possible. Um, the industry that I've been in, uh, which is you know, kind of summer sales door-to-door -door and different services that we kind of started out in, we've competed a lot against hundreds of businesses that have kind of come and gone. And uh, you know, in fact, I, one of our main competitors, Pinnacle, is gone now. They've been, they've been competing with us for, I don't know, 10 years, or maybe it's longer than that. Um, but everyone always uh, re you know, recruited or competed with us saying, hey, Vivint's too large, there's no opportunity for growth. And I laugh, I mean, we're at two billion, how big's uh, Facebook? And they're, I mean, they just went public. They're not a very old business. How, what's their market cap? Anyone know? 60 billion, 70 billion? What's uh, Apple? 500 billion, Google, 250. Um, what's, uh, and, and again, I, I start to look at some of the spaces that we're getting into, um, trying to compete with Comcast, um, Time Warner, Comcast, a $25 billion company, we're two. So my mentor is sometimes going, okay, I know what Comcast is, what they provide, how they provide it. I don't think it's great, personally. Um, they're only in 15% of the markets from a zip code perspective. And so I say, well, why can't we eventually be a $25 billion company? So that's maybe not a direct mentor, but I'm, I try to make sure I keep my eyes open to the possibilities. And I always, and have always, and people always say this, if someone else has done it, it's doable. And that is absolutely the truth. Now, there's a lot of decisions and good fortune that has to you know, happen along the way, but um, that, I tr really try to keep my eyes open to, to that and the possibility. And then, Something that's really maybe core to Vivint is we understand um, what we're really, really good at, and I try to understand what I'm not good at. And there's a lot of things I'm not good at, a lot. And so I am constantly surrounding myself with people that are great and best in class and always trying to bring in best people um, to you know, operate the business 
and help think through technology advancement and integration of technologies for the services that we're going to provide. Because to be honest, that's not my expertise. I get them, um, but I don't want to slow the business down. And I know sometimes it becomes a bottleneck as an employee or a manager inside of a business or a business owner, um, trying to be everything to everyone or trying to be controlling of everyone and everything. That doesn't work. Um, that just doesn't work and it does not scale. It's fine. Yes? Um, so Josh James, he sold uh, Omniture and then started his own new thing. You just sold Vivint. I understand the buyout. You're sticking with the company for a little bit longer. Are you planning on doing something else after that? Or no, are you stick with Vivint? No, it's, I mean, so the difference is he sold the, his, all his equity. Well, yeah. And I didn't. Right. Um, I kept a major stake in, the, not majority, but a big stake of the business. So for here, Sold so half my equity, kept half my equity. So for your career life, is that is Vivint you're gonna gonna be your? I mean, I understand you were from there from the beginning, but do you want to see it all the way out to the end, or, or are you trying to do something else? Like are you hungry for something else? So this is the cool thing about Vivint is um, Vivint hasn't lived itself out yet, not even close in my opinion, and how it feels. We're a startup still. Um, we're a startup, but we've built a platform. So you know, we started as really a security business. We're second largest in the nation from this uh, residential security business. We're the largest home automation company in, in North America. We launched a solar business, a solar division, residential solar. Solar City's our main competitor. We're now the second largest, and this is in 12 months. This is what's cool about our company now. We understand what we are and what we're great at. Um, and it's customer acquisition, it's installation, it's um, integration of technologies. We're the second largest uh, residential solar company in North America after 12 months. We'll, be, we'll pass Solar City at some point in time. Um, we have the ability to scale and in, understand how to scale businesses that fit on our platform very rapidly and very cost effectively, um, which is super critical to any business. Um, and we have um, additional services and industries that we're going to enter over time. And so I would say, n no, this isn't my last career because we're building and developing onside the Vivint platform my next careers that are all going to be integrated and combined. That's why I love this thing. This, is not, this isn't, um, we've done it, we got there, we're gonna eventually be number one while we're on top. We're starting over all the time, um, but staying really, really focused on execution of, of what is core to the business, which is changing and evolving, because um, that, that has to. You know, if, you're, if you don't change and evolve as a business, you're gonna die. I mean, Sony, you guys don't, I remember Sony, does anyone care about Sony? Um, tell me why. PlayStation. Okay, <laughs> but I mean, they, they were like it. They were like Google um, back when I was younger. I don't, other than PlayStation, they're, they're not very relevant. And I, I'd like to say they're not relevant. I don't think they are very re relevant anymore. They kind of missed the mark. They did not evolve and change. And again, I'm not trying to be judgmental of them. They're a big company. But I don't, I don't think they've made money in like three years, maybe longer. Um, they just didn't. Kodak, I mean, you can name company after company that just got it handed to them because they did not understand what was going on around the competitor environment and adapt and change and, and drive innovation. 